The Erotic Silence of the American Wife. This is a book that was written in the early 90s or in the 80s, published in 1990. However, I feel it is just as revealing today as it was to women of that time. The author interviews a number of women who were like not trying to be the good girls, the sexually adventurous women with life in them and how they changed once they became wives and why they had affairs, even though they loved their husbands. And I'll just try to summarize it in a few ways and read a little bit out of here. It's like women try to stifle themselves into their concept of what a wife is and what a good wife is. And what a good wife is, is like June Cleaver. She is not a person. She's devoid of a person. She's selfless in the service of others. Now, I think that has changed a lot, that we no longer expect women to be selfless in the service of others like it used to be. Women are encouraged to have their own interests and they have their own careers. However, when it comes to sexuality, for me, I still feel it. And I wonder if any of you feel it, that what is written in this book is just as much true today, that to be a good wife means to have no sexual history no sexual wants or longings other than for your husband and to distance yourself as much as possible from your sexuality. So whereas a man is expected to still desire other women after he's married, but he won't pursue it, a woman is expected to not even want it at all. And as little girls, we have all read all the fairy tales, you know, of, um, you know, the, the princess who is just the object for the prince. She doesn't have wants or desires of her own other than to be the object that the prince wants. The emphasis in religion and in, in schools that tell a girl that she's good by not being sexual. The good girl is a virgin until she's married and then she has desires only for that one man that is putting a real woman into a box of how she should be she has no wants. she's not wild she doesn't want to fuck and scream and roar you know she can be contained and small and skinny she's not strong and muscular and big you know, we have to keep her voice small so she doesn't threaten anything. You know, we have to keep her contained and small and skinny and with no sexual energy other than for her husband. Because what will we do with the woman who is sexually enlivened? She could be a huge threat. And that's just kind of like our social programming around female sexuality in this country. I will say in other parts of the world, women are actually supposed to cover their bodies and I guess just be raped and pillaged by the men at their whim. Like a woman's sexual power, excuse me, is still a threat to a lot of society, a lot in the world. And that's why I will never be on Oprah talking about the fuck list because I think I'm a threat even to Oprah. She can't handle it. A lot of people can't handle it. Sometimes I can't handle women's sexuality. Like, I don't see it. It's always repressed. And there's nothing that will repress it more than being a girlfriend or being a wife because it has all these connotations with not wanting, uh, compromising yourself for the sake of your husband, you know, to be a good wife. And it's not that he's forcing you to do it. We do it to ourselves through our conditioning of what a good wife is. So I would like to read to you some really cool passages from this book. Now, uh, I'm going to read the part about the perfect wife, the perfect woman. Uh, and some of this may not apply so much to women younger women today, but it might apply to women who are watching this who could be in their 70s. They may relate to this more. 
The perfect wife is, of course, Donna Reed. She is beautiful, smiling, supportive, contented, giving, feminine. She is, in a word, good. Good, as it applies to the perfect wife, inevitably modifies and diminishes the word self, as in self-sacrifice, self-abnegate, self-restraint, self-denial. The suffix always restraining or containing or constraining in an effort to make that woman's self a little less something. If she can annihilate herself altogether and still manage to seem contented, then she has achieved the additional heroic feat of holding on to their femininity, that elusive quality women are always in danger of losing whenever their selves threaten to burst through all of the constraints. It diminishes most dramatically when she displays her sexuality openly, for overt sexuality is antipathetic to femininity. She is thought to have had more femininity in the past than she does today because the constraints on her sexuality were so much greater then. Now let's talk about the perfect girl. The perfect girl, uh, the perfect girl, first of all, she is, um, hold on. <laughs> well, the perfect girl is who other people want her to be. So let's talk about the perfect girl's alternative is to be the kind of girl who rejects the ideal outright and refuses to believe in the reality of the saccharine creature and her false relationships and her stifled sexuality. The kind of girl who remains outspoken about what she sees and knows and feels. You know this girl. She wears a lot of makeup, maybe. She's overtly sexual. She ridicules phoniness and talks about it out loud. She dares to look and dress and speak and do precisely as she wishes. She doesn't care about the perfect girl. For not caring, though, and for not being pleasing, for her anger and her defiance, such a girl is called bad. But more than anything else, bad means sexual. The perfect girl, above all, is chaste. This, even more than her beauty and her compliance, is what makes her perfect in the first place. Virginity is the perfect girl's trademark. It is what allows her parents and her teachers to relax. A girl's sexuality must go underground if it is to be acceptable to teachers and parents who are crucial in determining how she feels about herself. So I think that is where a lot of women come from in wanting to be the perfect wife, like the ideal that our society sets as who are we supposed to be as perfect wives. And we want to be good wives, right? We want to be good wives. We want God to love us. We want our partners to love us. Like we want to be part of society. We want to be a contribution. Let me fix my hair. There. Doesn't have to be perfect. Let's just let it be wild. I don't want to be the perfect girl. I want to be wild. And that's why I don't want to date guys my age. Because I think that to me makes me feel like I'm in the straight jacket of the perfect girl, the perfect wife who has to leave her sexuality behind. And as I've said in other videos, it wasn't that men made me do this, but I, I was taught as a young woman growing up that by society, that I, as a woman, show my interest in a man by killing off a large part of myself. All desires for other men, all desires I've ever had for other men, and my sexuality, and I must keep my sexuality small. It can't be a bubbling cauldron. It can't be alive and on fire. It has to be kept contained to be a good wife because a good wife is, after all, someone who was a virgin. And even if she did have sex, it didn't really mean as much as the sex she has with her 
husband, which is really the only sex that really should matter in the eyes of God and good people. And so, you know, um, the girl, the perfect girl, the perfect wife, puts herself in a straitjacket. And then to break out of it, you know, she has an affair or she goes shopping or she starts drinking with her friends or in my case, takes pills. And sometimes the perfect girl trying to be the perfect wife is married to someone who doesn't really care about her sexuality, driving it even further underground, which is, you know, what happened with me, my ex-husband, uh, I was not needy at all. All I wanted was to go out to dinner maybe a couple times a month and do a weekend with him away maybe a couple times a year and have sex that was about both of our pleasure. He didn't want any of that. You know, he neglected me sexually and as a wife. And that's the price I was willing to pay to be a mom and to have my family. Now, at this time in my life, there is no reason for me to get married. I don't need a husband to have kids. I don't need a man to provide for me. So I'm no longer willing to make that trade-off between security and freedom. And there is a trade-off, security versus freedom. I would love to hear from any of you who've been married more than 10 years, if you're able to feel free and sexual and unrestrained in your relationship. Is that even possible? Is it possible to feel free and unrestrained in your relationship if you're monogamous? And then monogamy is this additional trap we put on ourselves like I should only want you sexually and if I don't there's something wrong with me and that is not even true. We are animals first and society has imposed us to try to live in this box you know anyway uh this book is really good i think it gives people a really good sense of how people can so easily feel trapped and it's because we diminish girls erotic feelings and erotic desires you know every mother should tell her daughter the genital parts and name them because if you never name your child's genital parts if you don't tell a girl that's your vagina that's your clitoris that's for your pleasure those are your labia it's it's healthy for you to masturbate do it in the privacy of your own room just do it when you want if you don't give it names kids will think it's bad or it's shameful they'll try to kill it off and numb it and then that's where all these problems come in and people kill off a part of themselves. You can even be a single person and have killed off your sexuality in an effort to be pleasing to the people at your church or to your parents or to your kids. You know, your sexuality doesn't mean you have to walk around in high heels and mini skirts and skimpy bikinis. Sexuality is any expression of your sensuality it can be wearing red lipstick. It can just be dancing, you know. It can be just walking, you know. It can be just flirting with someone or singing. And of course, it will be masturbating and having sex with someone if you want to. Like, just notice where... You have silenced yourself. Nobody can silence you. You do it to yourself. Unless you're in some oppressive country like Afghanistan, you're silencing yourself. So that's an important point to remember. So um, girls are supposed to seem sexy, but not be sexy. So I say, fuck all that. And... You know, I guess this is just like waking up maybe to some of you for a part of yourself, to a part of yourself that you've abandoned that didn't have to be abandoned. 
and thank you for watching my video.